Praise the Lord. Good morning, IPC Hebron. It is only by the blood of the Lamb that we are saved, as we were singing. Amen. 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 To redeem what was taken at the first tree in Eden, Jesus was willing to be hung upon another tree, which is the cross. Amen. Amen. If you look at the first century context, you will see that Roman crucifixion was one of the most horrific forms of torture reserved only for the lowest types of criminals. It was associated with severe shame, and not only were Roman citizens exempt from this humiliating death, but even the word crucifixion was avoided in social gatherings. And so in the Jewish mindset as well, crucifixion was seen through the lens of Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, that said that anyone who hangs upon a tree is cursed. Given such realities that he lived in a Roman empire and he lived among his Jewish people, Jesus Christ was willing to go on the cross for us. And by him going on that tree for us, he leveled the playing field that you don't have to be a Jew anymore, that every Gentile, you and me, every Malayali, every other non-Jew can, can be brought to the foot of the cross. And that's what we will meditate on today as we study from the book of Acts, chapter 25, and verse uh, 26, verse 1 through 23. So if you would turn to Acts chapter 25 and 26 as you meditate upon the cross of Christ. We will study a sermon that is entitled, Detained Without Just Cause, Yet Double Cured. Let me repeat that. Detained Without Just Cause, Yet Double Cured. The subtitle I gave it, Nevertheless He Persisted to Rome, where Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. If you look at the background of the Roman Empire, you'll see that in 509 B.C., Rome was ruled by the neighboring Etruscan kings. And it was only in 500 B.C. that it became a minor city within uh, Italy. And it was in 200 B.C. that the Rome Republic conquered the rest of Italy. And so it was just that boot of Italy that was Rome, or, or the Roman Republic. But it was in 27 uh, B.C. that the Republic became an empire, and it was the empire that ruled all of Europe and all of that land for the next 400 or so years. And we see that Paul is, we're studying Paul as a prisoner. Uh, we talked about him in Jerusalem, and now we went before the Sanhedrin. We went uh, last week and started to talk about how he went before Felix, Antonio Felix and Drusilla, Justin covered that last week. Today we will look at how he appeared in front of Governor Porcius Festus and also in front of Herod King Agrippa II and Bernice. At the end of this, uh, Paul will appeal to Caesar and will be sent to Rome before the Emperor Nero and will eventually lead to his exec execution in Rome. Let me remind you what the Holy Spirit had told Paul, that you would be my witness for me in Rome as well. Amen. And Paul, when he was converted, the Lord had told him that you would be my witness, witness before me in front of kings. And uh, so some of the promises that the Lord had made is coming to pass in this portion that we will look at. As you see in this picture, you see that Rome was just a small uh, little portion when it started in 500 B.C. around the, sh the, he the shin of that boot of Italy. And then within a matter of uh, a few hundred years, the Roman Empire spanned across the entire uh, land there. 
if we were to think about the land mass from Britain to Alexandria, it would be as big as the land from Seattle, Washington to Florida. That's how much the land mass was. But obviously, there was an ocean in between the Mediterranean Ocean. And Rome was set up that there, it was ruled by um, Caesar or an emperor that was the head person. But for the Jewish parts, there was a king assigned. And there was also governors for each smaller areas that were assigned. That's at least my understanding of it. And in order to understand this portion uh, that we will study today, we will need to have some understanding of this. If we can go to the next slide, we will look at Paul's voyage to Rome, his death and arrest. Some people call it the fourth missionary journey. Although not a lot of people were saved except in the island of Malta, when the people see that he's bit by the snake and he is not dead, many come to the Lord. But when he appears before these dignitaries, when he appears before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, and when he appears before the governors and the kings, no one is willing to listen, but he was still preaching the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus. In AD 57, we saw Paul come back to Jerusalem, and in 57 to 59, he was in front of Governor Felix, and um, he was in Caesarea Maritime that you can see on the map, Caesarea Maritime. After Felix uh, had, he had gone before Felix, he was forgotten about for about two years. Felix went and visited him often, expecting a bribe, as Justin talked about last week. And uh, he was basically in this prison. And between chapter 24 and 25, there is a gap of two years. Many times, even if you're in the perfect will of God, there is waiting, child of God. Two years, he was just waiting there. And he was able to observe many things during that time. In AD 57 to 60 is the portion we will look at today where Paul appears before Governor Porcius Festus and King Agrippa and Bernice and appeals to Caesar and thus starts his voyage to Rome. We will also find out that in 60, he was shipwrecked in Malta and was snake bit. And in 60 to 62, he's under house arrest in Rome, where he writes the most beautiful epistles, the canonical, canonical uh, epistles, the prison epistles. And then again, in AD 62 to 64, uh, he writes the pastoral epistles. And then in 64, he was rearrested and his head cut off by the Emperor Nero. That's the circumstances uh, behind the, the portion that we will study today. If you would turn your attention with me to chapter 25, um, um, as you're going there, one more background. The particular king that we will talk about today is King Herod Agrippa II and Bernice. Let me give you a little bit of a background on him. You see, he's on the very bottom there, Herod Agrippa II, and that's who Paul in this chapter of 25 and 26 is appearing before. Do you know who his father is? His father is King Agrippa, Agrippa I, Herod Agrippa I, and he is the one that killed Apostle James, the son of thunder, James and John. He killed James. He's the same one that in chapter 12 of Acts, put Peter in prison, and how the Lord miraculously let him escape. And in that same chapter, we see that when he was speaking, people said that he sounded like God, uh, God and uh, when he would not give the glory to God and took up all of the glory to himself in Acts chapter 12, we're reminded that the worms ate him, and then he died. That's Herod Agrippa I. That's the father of the person that he's appearing before. If you look at his uncle, his great uncle, Herod Antipas, he is the Herod that had John the Baptist beheaded and his head on a platter. The wife of Philip, Herodias, uh, wanted that, and the daughter danced before him and asked for this wish, and Herod Antipas had to 
uh, give in and give and executed John the Baptist. He was also the one that tried, uh, when Pilate bought the case before him, he said no and sent it back to Pilate, the case of Jesus and his death. And then we go all the way back to his great-grandfather, Herod the Great, and we see it in Luke and Matthew, the early portions. We see he's the one that was ruling uh, at the time of the birth of Jesus. We know that the magicians, uh, or not the magicians, the, the wise men from the east, uh, went and uh, saw this Herod the Great and said there is a king of the Jews born. And so when the magicians, uh, sorry, the wise men tricked him and went another way, he is the one that ordered that every boy under two be killed. So this is the kind of person that he is standing in front of. The great grandfather, the grand uncle, or the great uncle, and the father, and the lineage. Uh, the more important thing is they were Edomites. They were descendants of Esau. If you study the uh, book of Genesis, and also in Romans chapter 9, as we studied in Sunday school this morning, we see that God had chosen Jacob over Esau. And the Edomites uh, always represented the world. And we see here an example of after the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross, Herod Agrippa had a chance for salvation, even though uh, they might not have been chosen in the Old Testament times uh, to be in the lineage of Jesus. Here, after the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, Herod Agrippa hears the gospel, and he rejects it, is what we will see. So if you would come with me to Acts uh, chapter 25. We will look at this portion quickly and then get into a, a, a small study, a theological study. So we see that three days after Festus became the king, so Felix was removed, and three days after Festus became the king, he went to Jerusalem. And uh, the people, uh, the high priests and the Sanhedrin came out to Festus and said, hey, do you know about this guy that's in prison there for two years? His name is Paul, and we want him to come back to Jerusalem to stand trial, and we want to uh, bring him back. And Festus probably was told by Felix about him and said, no, uh, his jurisdiction is in, uh, was in Caesarea, and he needs to stay there. If you guys want to come with me, you can. I'll go back in a few days. And so we see that the Jews, uh, the, the, law the lawyers and the Jews, came and tried to accuse Paul, and no charges would stick. We see that uh, Paul is answering that I have done nothing wrong to anyone, to the Jews, the Gentiles, to the temple, nothing. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish religion or the temple or Caesar, period, he said. And Festus had to rule that he had done nothing wrong. But he still asked him, do you want to go to Jerusalem and be tried there? And that is when Paul, using his shrewdness likely, said, no, I am at the highest court here in Caesarea. I want to go to Rome. And I don't know if it went through Paul's mind what the Lord had told him that he would be a witness for me in Rome. But he used that privilege uh, to go and get that right to go to Rome instead of going back to Jerusalem. We see in those portions that if he had gone back to Jerusalem, there were people waiting to kill him. In chapter 23 uh, and 22, we learned how there were 40 Jewish men that would not eat and it was fasting uh, to kill Paul uh, until he is uh, killed. And that's when his nephew tells, finds out about the plot and saves him. And that's how he ends up in Caesarea to begin with. So he knows that if he goes back to Jerusalem, that he, he would be killed. And the Lord also knew that if he ended up a free man and Festus had let him go, uh, according to his ruling, then he might have also been killed because he would have to go through land and go through many Jewish areas to get to Rome himself. But the Lord had a sovereign plan as well. And even though he was not guilty, there was no charges against him, he was still kept under lock and chain. Um, and he was imprisoned in Caesarea. And then uh, we see that uh, there are some visitors that come to greet Festus. Festus had become the new governor, and uh, there was 
a king that we just learned about, Agrippa II, Herod Agrippa King II, that came along with his half-sister Bernice, who also happened to be his wife, and uh, came and uh, uh, after having some pleasantries, here Festus is at a loss. He's like saying, if I send him to Rome as he's requesting, which is his right to do that he goes to Rome, I need some sort of charge against him. If I send him to Rome to Caesar without a charge, then my job might be on, on the line or my life might be on the line. Yes, I want to please the Jews and send him and not release him, which was in the plan of God likely, but he also needed some sort of charge against him. And so King Agrippa and Bernice heard the case. They, uh, he told them about the case and uh, they were interested and they wanted to hear the case of Paul. And that's what we'll get to in chapter 26. So in chapter 25, it ends with the uh, beginning of this case, the pomp and the circumstance, the pomp and the fantasia, it's called, around the king and Bernice coming in. Can you imagine with me uh, the royal king sitting on his throne and this poor prisoner Paul, who was, according to history, a shorter man, a bald man, and he was uh, in prison clothes, and uh, he was standing in front of this great pomp and circumstance. And in chapter 26, we see Paul making his defense. And Paul says to uh, uh, Agrippa, Agrippa first said, go ahead and tell us about yourself. And Paul says, um, he goes on to say his story and his conversion. He saw, talks about the road to Damascus experience. He talks about his background, how he was a Pharisee, and he had learned uh, uh, so much and learned so much and knew the Jewish customs well. And uh, the only reason that they are attacking him is because of the resurrection, which we've studied in another time. And then we see the Lord speaking directly to uh, the Lord speaking directly to Paul. And that's the portion that we will study here um, today. So if you look at uh, verse 16, ch chapter 26, verse 16 onwards is the portion that we will study. We already saw that Paul made his defense before Festus, and he's making his defense before King Agrippa and Festus and Bernice, and he is retelling the, for the third time his road to Damascus experience. And he adds some things that were not mentioned in Acts chapter 9 or 22 when he had a different audience. So for this particular audience, for the king, he adds some more flavor to it. And he adds some more details uh, to his story. And we will look at that particular portion where the voice of the Lord Jesus spoke to Paul. You might see that that portion is red in your Bible. It's in the red letter, which means that Jesus is the one speaking. Verse 14 onwards, I will start with. And when all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I say, who are you? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So we've talked about this earlier in the series as well. A goad is a long stick with a pointed edge that is used to poke an oxen. And here uh, the Lord is telling Paul, it is of no use for you to fight against me because I have chosen you. You are going to be a weapon in my hands to bring the good news of the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles, to the kings and to the rulers. So there's no point in fighting me, Paul. And we see so many of our, uh, we think Paul is far gone, right? He is the one that is hurting the Christians. And he is an enemy of the people of the way up to this point. And we have so many friends and family that we might think, Man, there's no hope for them because they are so anti everything that I have to tell them about the gospel. But if Paul is an example for us, never give up, never give up, keep on praying. And at the right time, the Lord will use his gold if he had to, to prick them out and bring them into the saving grace and the knowledge of Christ. Never give up, 
child of God. And I said to you, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So there's no question here that Jesus is the one speaking from uh, this portion. And next he says, but arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. Here the Lord is giving him instructions to rise up, and I'm going to give you the purpose for your life. I'm going to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things that you have seen me and to the things that I will appear to you and teach you in the future, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Here the Lord is commissioning him with a special purpose. And here, uh, particularly, the next portion here, verse 18 onwards, is what I would like to study as our uh, theological lesson today. Verse 18, it talks about the difference between the non-believer and the believer. And it's the Lord Jesus teaching Paul what is the difference between the non-believer and the believer. And we see five different contrasts that I was able to come up with. Uh, if you can put that slide up. It's a gospel in a nutshell. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. We see, to open their eyes so that they might turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to, the, uh, to God, and that they might receive forgiveness of sin and a place, and in the King James it says an inheritance, among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So when I looked at it, I saw a comparing and a contrasting. Those who don't know Jesus are in spiritual blindness, but when Jesus is transforming their life with the gospel, we see a spiritual vision, an inner eye that is opened that they can see the truth about Christ. The people that are in darkness and living in darkness don't know the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Anyone who does not know the gospel of the Lord Jesus, Jesus himself is saying they are living in darkness. They're spiritually blind. But if you want to live in, according to the gospel, you're living in the light. The people of this world are under the power of Satan, whether you believe it or not. But you can be transformed to the power of God when you believe in the Lord Jesus. They're easily beset by sins, but those who believe in the Lord Jesus are sanctified daily by the Holy Spirit, and they're able to live by faith in Christ alone, a sanctified life daily. Those, the last portion there says, those who are living according to the world are headed for eternal damnation, while those who know the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus and live according to it are headed for eternal inherit, uh, inheritance in heaven. It, it is true, child of God, it is true, children, that the people around you that don't know Jesus, you don't think of them any differently, do you? You think of them as your friend in school. You think of them as just the average Joe. And you might think that they uh, are okay, but without knowing the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself is saying that they're spiritually blind, that they're living in darkness, that they're under the power of Satan, that they're easily beset by sin and not sanctified, and they're headed for eternal damnation. So the Lord Jesus himself is giving a gospel in a nutshell in that verse. And then Paul replies and said, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, and then in Jerusalem, and throughout all of the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Here, not only does it talk about a salvation experience, but it also talks about after repenting, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. It talks about working out your salvation daily, living a sanctified life, for this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. And to this day, I've had help that comes from God. So I stand here testifying both to small and to great, saying nothing but what the prophets and, the Moses, uh, and Moses said would come to pass, that Christ must suffer, and by being the first one to raise from the dead, uh, that he would proclaim light 
both to our people and to the Gentiles. Here we see that Paul digs in on Agrippa and is saying the reason for the hope that he has, that he was obedient to the heavenly vision and the reason that the Jews are seizing him and trying to kill him. It is because of a fundamental difference. They believe in, the, in keeping the laws, that keeping the laws, that being good and following the rules of Moses would take them to heaven. But Jesus came and changed all of that by believing on the Lord Jesus. You can have atonement for your sins and you can be justified with God and you can lead a sanctified life. And that is the only way by the grace of the Lord Jesus, by having faith in the Lord Jesus that you can be saved is what he tells this King Agrippa. We see that this Edomite king uh, has a response. And uh, I believe the next person will cover some of the responses of Festus and this Edomite king. He says, are you trying to convert me in this few minutes? See, we see that Edom came from Esau, as we said earlier. And God had chosen Jacob over Esau. And we see here God is giving the Edomites a chance, and he is rejecting it. Here we see Agrippa, who came from that line of Esau, having a chance, being on a level playing field at the cross of Jesus. But he at least had a chance, and he heard it, but he refused to believe. Amen? So what can we learn from this portion? The title that I gave it was uh, very familiar to you. It was detained without a cause, yet double cured. And what does that mean, double cured? My time is running out, but let me explain a couple of things. Ex expiation is the act of making amends or reparation for guilt. And that means to cut out our guilt taking away our guilt through the payment of a penalty or the offering of an atonement. And Jesus has done that for us. And that's one part of the double cure, uh, that he has saved us from the guilt of sin. And the next part, the other side of that coin, is propitiation, the act of gaining or regaining favor or goodwill of someone who you have wronged. So we know that God is a just God and that uh, to appear before him, we need to be just and by human effort, we cannot be just. It is only through the blood of Jesus and imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus upon us that we are able to be just. So uh, when the Lord looks at us, it is through the process of propitiation that we are restored into fellowship and favor with the Lord. So when you compare uh, and combine uh, these two things, expiation and propitiation, we are able to placate the wrath of God, and we become justified before the Lord Jesus. So that is the word justification. It is a legal stance uh, that says, that pronounces a sinner to be righteous because of the sinner's faith in Christ Jesus. It is not by our merits. Let me tell you, it is not anything, uh, uh, all the good works, all the punya pravrti that you've done. It is because of the Lord Jesus only and it is the Lord Jesus' imputed righteousness that we can be justified before the Lord. The next uh, portion, not only does Paul in this portion talk about justification and how a sinner's faith in Christ Jesus and the work that he had done on the cross, but not only the work on the cross, he talks about the resurrection. You know, many churches speak about the death, the burial, the blood of Christ, but the, without the resurrection, as we learned a few weeks ago, there is no hope. And it is by the resurrection as well that we have justification. Those who have been justified, those who have had that atonement or expiation, those who have had that good graces or propitiation, and those who have been justified, they need to continually turn and repent uh, and keep with the calling and the deeds in keeping with repentance in verse 20, it says. So it is not a one time, say, say uh, this after me, that I will confess uh, the Lord as my personal savior, but it is a daily process of working out your salvation, working out sanctification that the Lord requires of you. Amen. I know my time is gone. Let me uh, conclude here, if I can, uh, by bringing a couple of life applications as the worship team is coming up.
Children of God, we're living in a wicked generation. This generation and the culture of this generation is quite in a moral decay. And as parents, as teachers, uh, Sunday school teachers, we need to guide and plant seeds to make disciples of our children. And as Paul did here, we're able to turn our trials into a testimony. He was able to turn the opposition into an opportunity. He was ready to defend his faith. I urge the parents to teach your children such biblical truths as to why you believe what you believe. Because once they hit high school or college, there will be people that are in darkness that are according to the, uh, to the power of this world, the five things that we listed uh, that are not saved, that look very good, that will try to influence your child. But there's only one way, and that is through the Lord Jesus. And if you can teach him why you believe what you believe, then they will also follow after the way of the Lord. They will have a personal experience with the Lord Jesus, and they will also be part of the elect of the Lord. Uh, Paul's life here ser serves as a reminder that no matter what we're going through in life's difficulties and opposition, that we can stand for the Lord. Paul, we see, goes on to Rome. He goes through a shipwreck, and he's able to write many books, uh, 13, 14 books in the Gospels, uh, uh, in the epistles, and those are the words of God that we still have. So in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our difficulties, if we stick fast to the Lord, he's able to use us mightily. May the Lord bless you all with these words.